All right. Um, hello, everyone. This is Hannah Imperial Cannon with Sense Labs, and I am joined today by Jamie Wilkinson. Um, Jamie is a VFX supervisor, CG supervisor, cinematographer, and stereographer, and digital artist. Um, Jamie's going to show us some wonderful stuff that he's done over his career um, in his his life in movies. Uh, Jamie. Uh, you go. Are you all set? Thank you, Hannah. Uh, yeah, like I said, uh, my name is Jamie Wilkinson. Um, I've been working with uh, computer graphics in 2D and 3D for quite a while. And uh, what we're going to go through over is some, uh, we'll show you some projects that I've been working on. Uh, we'll dive into some process and some um, um, workflows for uh, some of the project uh, shots that we I've worked on in my career and hopefully everybody will be entertained and uh, if you have questions please uh, throw them out in the chat and we'll try to get to them so that uh, every, everybody's questions get answered. So I'm going to start with here is a little project reel of uh, some of the projects and shows that I've worked on. So that's just a uh, small uh, sampling of uh, some of the stuff I've worked on. I've worked uh, on several other features. I, Like I said, I've been in the industry for a while. I did some work on the original Jurassic Park, worked on What Dreams May Come, uh, and so on and so forth. What we're going to do here is I want to show you some of the... I can just say that was phenomenal, Jamie. <laughs> Absolutely phenomenal. I, I was dancing through the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That is great. What I want to go through here is uh, some uh, uh, work and process of how we did uh, some, came to some artistic decisions, some visual decisions, and technical decisions on the uh, Ice Age uh, work we I did with Blue Sky. Um, so we'll work, we're going to show some Dawn of the Dinosaurs footage here and some behind the scenes stuff. So with uh, Ice Age 3 or Dawn of the Dinosaurs. It was uh, the first 3D movie that uh, that uh, uh, Blue Sky had done. I mean, what I mean by that is in stereo, in stereo or stereoscopic uh, projection. Um, and it's also had a, a slew of new characters. Um, and I'm going to go over the process on some of these new character designs here. We're going to start with the um, Scratte character or the female Scrat. Um, she is a flying squirrel. Um, so you'll see some of that footage here or some of the, the artwork here. 
So these are some of the initial designs for the uh, the Scratchy character. Um, as the uh, director, art director, and characters and designers go through this, she'll, her design changes a little bit um, as we go through this. Try to see her in different poses. Once a final design has been um, decided upon, we do some pose tests. That's what this uh, is. It's a what we call a composition, a composition sheet or a model sheet uh, with uh, the character in multiple poses. I'm going to slow down here a little bit so that you get an idea to take a look at these images. Uh, here's a you know character interaction sheet uh, with Scratte, how she flies, uh, how she acts, how she interacts with us with Scrat. Um, this drawing here, uh, and all these obviously just initial drawings from the art department and character designers. But after a while, the, what Blue Sky would do is uh, take a drawing and create a sculpt, a 3D sculpt out of it. And that's done traditionally with a wire form, um, clay, and you know traditional sculpting tools. So from that template that we just saw, this is the sculpt that was generated from that. Here's some uh, close-up shots of the sculpt to show, to show you some of the detail. How do they use the sculpts in the, in the whole? The sculpts are used for um, reference for the modelers, uh, mm -hmm. because up until now, all the modelers have are drawings that are pretty rough. Uh, mm -hmm. The sculpt is the first time that the character is set in stone, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, once that final maquette is approved, then um, the character design is quote unquote finished. Um, and I say quote unquote because that changed for another character that we're gonna talk about. Um, and then this model or this maquette is uh, scanned in through multiple mediums and uh, it is used to compare against what the modelers actually generate. So if there's, you know, key differences or changes that need to be made, like maybe the eyelashes need to be longer or something like that, the modelers can see what the sculpt looks like versus what they've modeled. And that's all just point cloud data, you know, either through a, a CyberWare Z camera, um, a sensible uh, ferro arm, something like that, or, or a Minolta laser uh, scanner. So... After so, the maquette is done, I'm sorry. So it's so it's to make sure that all the references, so an eyeball is not too small, or the yeah, or the, length, it, the length of the arms are just right, and you get a 360 view of it. Yes, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also just to make sure the design aesthetic is on point, because if the director mm -hmm. looks, you know, doing it in 2D is different. You know, using pencil and paper to sketch out drawings, although. That's not how Blue Sky does it. It was all done in Photoshop. So the character designers would draw their uh, everything inside Photoshop. Most of them would. Some of them would sketch ideas on the train to work and then a uh, sketch pad and then retranspose that into Photoshop uh, during the day. But uh, all those drawings really don't give you a sense of how it looks like if the camera moves around it. That's one of the reasons for the maquette. Uh, the maquette is a sculpt of it, so they can look at it at all different angles, um, and the director will just sit there with it in his office and just make sure everything is, is right. After that, then, um, or in conjunction with that, once the, uh, the um, maquette is finalized, then we have facial studies to find out how extreme facial poses are going to be and how the character is going to react. Yeah. After that, actually it's not, this is not really a sequential thing because um, once the maquette is done or once the model is close to being done, a lot of these other things start happening. Um, the facial poses, the uh, body poses, and this is what we call a color call out. Um, this defines, this is a reference sheet for the, material department and animation for, for that matter to, to see what this character is supposed to look like, mm -hmm. uh, what textures, uh, what the fur is supposed to look like, 
the colors of the stripes, the color of the eyes, everything. Oh, and you use references as well, I see. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's, we, we always pull from real world references, like, you know, the sheen in her nose come, you know, it's supposed to be like the, this, uh, this hound, this is how flying squirrel looks like. All of these references are brought together by the art director and the art department to define every little nuance of this, how this character looks. Mm -hmm. And then we do some animation post studies, calisthenics, to make sure <laughs> that the character's rig and model work the way every, the animation department needs it to. So is there, it's a separate rigging department? Yes. Uh, there's, after modeling is done, the model goes down to rigging. Rigging will put the skeleton and deformers and all the controllers in there so the animators can uh, animate the character easily. She is a flying squirrel, um, and this is obviously how the uh, animation department first saw how her wings would uh, flap in the breeze. She's very cute. Yeah, and it's interesting that uh, she's a flying squirrel, so she flies. He's not, so he falls <laughs> <laughs> constantly. <laughs> Right off, right off the iceberg, or what have you? Oh, he's in love. <laughs> okay, so that's how the design process for Scratch went. For the dinosaurs, of T Rex mom specifically, which is another major character in the movie, uh, the process was a bit different. Um, here again, we start with sketches. Try to get an idea how she should look, her proportion to Manny uh, and the other uh, characters in the movie. Close-ups of, since she has to interact with Sid, so there's a lot of studies between size relationships between uh, the T-Rex mom and Sid. And here, this one here is the, uh, actually, is that the one? Yeah, well, it's not quite. Um, but this is the um, sketch study for the maquette for to the T-Rex mom. Hmm. And here's the armature for her. So this is what's inside before any clay is put on. And this armature here is Sid hanging on. And this is what it looks like. Whoops. Wow, phenomenal. So another major uh, uh, benefit here of doing the maquettes, especially in an animated feature, you can see as the character is opposed what the shadows, how they fall on the muscles of the character. So it works out really well. Once, um, like I said, once the maquette is done, <laughs> we scan it in. And this is a laser scanner that would, uh, we, we'd use to scan it in so that the animators or the modelers then have a reference for that to, based on what they're actually modeling. So they can hit their targets. Now, typically, they don't model it in these poses. They'll model it in a, a neutral pose or a, um, a T pose or the Da Vinci pose, depending on the type of character. Here's a pharaoh arm. Uh, this is a sensible technologies uh, arm. Uh, they're using a piece of software. It's called Clay something. I forgot the name of it. Um, but it, this is a haptic device where um, as you take the pen and push, the model pushes back so you feel that you're painting on the model or sculpting the model right there so it's a pretty neat device pretty much nobody uses them anymore because it's the software never really got to be the to the point where it should have been but what a great concept oh it's, yeah it's an awesome concept um the company's still in business they just don't sell that, that device anymore they mm -hmm. sell higher end Ferro scanner arms and things like that. So here's uh, again the um, um, this is the um, a study for the spikes and scales for the character. Um, the, 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 this is what we call a drawover. So this is the actual neutral pose that uh, the T Rex mom was modeled in. Uh, it was brought into Photoshop, and the artists, the des character designers, will come in and place where the spikes are on the nose 
and on the uh, the neck, and then get approvals from that from the art, art director. So for color studies, the T-Rex mom went through several um, because they, they kept on going through iteration after iteration because they really didn't like anything they had seen initially. Um, so once they finally got to a point, then they'd take it and uh, start uh, developing the scales or a, uh, the color callout sheet for the uh, T-Rex mom. Uh, here again, we've got uh, real life photographs to use as reference for the textures and the colors and everything for this character. Or, um, and, you know, and there's little notes here from the art department and the designers and art directors just to, to modeling to say what these things should look like and what um, parts to accentuate or not. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with the um, T-Rex mom, uh, the pattern on her was, uh, that was the, one of the things that we did a lot of uh, iterations on because uh, there was a lot of them they just didn't like the look of. So this is just one version. So um, after the design is done by art department, it goes to materials and materials tries to figure out how to do this. With uh, the T-Rex, um, her skin is a bunch of um, scales um, and we tried a lot of techniques, uh, bump maps, displacements, normal maps, and nothing really was popping and showing the look that the art department wanted to get. So what we did is here again, here's some reference for it. We developed the technique to actually place scales onto the skin of the character uh, to get a more defined look. So do you paint it you paint it on or you they were they were like yeah i've got some slides here i'm going to show you here uh to, that explains the process mm -hmm. so here's some facial studies motion studies how she tears down trees <laughs> and these are all play blasts from uh, maya oh, okay So here's the final color call out, the eyes and everything. Some more reference. We still hung on to the, the look of this, these scales on the, on the head, but changed the size of the scales on the body. And right here is where we um, did some work for the uh, scales. Um, these white lines represent wrinkles and they're actually uh, curves that are painted on the surface of this uh, model. That way we can come back and procedurally generate or place uh, all the bits. So here's the model inside of Maya. Um, you're gonna see that uh, obviously there's the mesh. We went through and painted um, intensity maps on different areas of the character. The whiter ones represent uh, larger scale uh, scales, medium, the gray is medium and the darker gray is, they get smaller and smaller. Um, so what we did was use that to place bits of scale geometry onto the character mm. in all the spots to get actual geo on there. And they should get bigger at the top. There we go. So these are the actual scales that were put on and went with the character as it was rendered. And here's final shots of how it looked. It's interesting, uh, as a note, the uh, executives at Fox didn't like the, uh, the sound of her roar she thought they thought that it would scare the children that were watching the movie. So they toned it down, mm. <laughs> especially in the 3D, because I was a stereoscopic supervisor on this show. And mm. when you're doing it in 3D, there were certain shots. I think this one right here, where she's coming right at the screen. And she screams right about, well, in the next shot, she'll scream. 
Um, and it was right at the camera and the executives thought that it was too violent. <laughs> so we toned it down. <laughs> uh, last character we're going to talk about is Buck. Is everybody's favorite character from uh, Ice Age, at least Ice Age 3. He is pretty funny. He's crazy. Mm. Buck had so many iterations. First, he was a weasel. Then he was a shorter weasel. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, the, yeah, he went through several color iterations, several fur iterations, um, long, tall, short, and everything. These are some alternates. Here's some more alternates. This is still just another alternate because we didn't go with that or this. There are some obviously things that they, the directors liked, the head, the leaf for the eye patch. We're getting closer here, especially with this design here and this one. They didn't like the squared off head. This is obviously more of what they went with. Do they, have, do they have a multiple character designers kind of competing for look? Actually, if you take a look, um, each character designer signed the these uh, sketches. This is Peter DeSev. Mm -hmm. um, this is somebody else. I don't know whose signature that is. Is that John? That may yep. be John's. Um, the, oh, so like, oh, I see. Yeah, you're yeah right. so yeah, they, they have several character designers. Uh, hmm. This is uh, Sang Jun, I think. That's still Sang Jun. Um, yeah. yeah, you notice some of the things, these are for inspiration only, don't model it, because the directors already said they didn't like parts of this, so don't waste your time. Hmm. But they like these concepts, you know, like the um, mission in action, Chuck Norris thing, <laughs> or Rambo coming out of the water. I have a question about, there's a question, a few questions that came in. Go ahead. Did you lay over textures as well, or is that another team? Um, well, that's what the nature of the paint overs are. Uh, mm -hmm. When we talked about the, um, uh, the T-Rex mom, we had that neutral pose, which was the side pose when I showed, you know, putting in um, the horns and spikes in the face and the neck. Um, the, the art department will take that and do what we call a draw over to add texture to it, to mm -hmm. see what it would look like before the modelers or the material department actually puts the 3D textures onto it. And so is that done with, um, what kind of application do you use for um, <laughs> You know? It's an interesting one. At Blue Sky Studios, um, they have a lot of custom software. A lot of the, the uh, materials are procedurally generated. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them are painted, but not much. Uh, like uh, the scratch, the textures are procedurally generated, even the stripes and everything. The scratch tay, I think, is the same way. Uh, so is Crash and Eddie. For T Rex Mom, we used some uh, patterns to generate. Uh, colors but i think the colors were actually procedurally generated so there, there's not that much um texture painting that is done on these characters uh or and there's definitely no 3d texture painting done everything would be do 2d in photoshop uh at high res and wrapped onto the character interesting uh, and, the, and the big reason for that is because at blue sky we had their own renderer um, and that renderer provided for a lot of flexibility, especially with materials. Um, it could actually, uh, we never really had, because of the way it was designed and written, uh, we really didn't have that much of an issue with slipping uh, UVs because the UVs were, could have been regenerated per frame procedurally. So here's some sculpt studies for, for uh, Buck. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. 
I think this is the one they used right there. Oh, no, it isn't. Uh, but there he is. That's his maquette. And they used some, did some of his poses down here as well. Yeah, so little ones of him. Little bucks. Little bucks. So this is what, what we were talking about earlier um, with the question with the materials. And if, this is a paint over. This is the 3D model. And mm -hmm. the actual designers will come back and say, well, we're draw in where the tufts of fur should be. Under his chin, on his shoulders, on his chest. And so on. And even, and even define, because right here, the tail is straight. You know, this is probably a, um, a direct, an art director note here to saying that uh, I want, I don't want it to be a ball and chain type of tail. Um, and the same with the hips to narrow the hips down. More art, art director notes. So you can see right here, this is in the model. These, this fur on his chest is just not pronounced enough. But what would happen was it would be uh, um, the fur team would take the model, the character and the model and actually groom fur onto him to get this a look, to, to get the look. Oh, wow. Because basically if you modeled that, it wouldn't flow right at all. So here's the color callouts, the reference for the material department. A lot of these are paint overs, you know, so that uh, the artist will sit there and do a full illustration of the character, different poses to highlight the look. Mm -hmm. Again, this is saying, Joan, he's really good. And here again, just like we did with Scrate and uh, well, not so much for the mom and T-Rex because she really doesn't talk. She just yells. Um, we have okay. facial studies. What's the difference between the blue and the red notes on the facial study? Oh, they're probably um, different people. Hmm. Uh, actually, there are two different handwritings, too. This is probably the art director, and this is probably the director, Carlos or, and Tom. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, yeah, because I don't think John uh, Duncan would have uh, made notes. Oh, I have a question from Bill Lindsay. Okay. Which character have you enjoyed working on the most? Um, let's see here. <laughs> that's that's going to be an interesting <laughs> one because uh, Buck was pretty fun. Um, but it's probably going to be, um, um, uh, it, it, I, when I worked at Disney, we did a feature called my peoples or we started a feature called my peoples and, um, it was you saw some of it in the reel. There was a character in there that wasn't in the reel that was called um, Crazy Ray, and uh, I can show you that uh, footage here after the slideshow um, of that character shot. He was a lot of fun to work yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, we definitely. He was crazy, and you have to remind me to make sure to show the Crazy Ray shot. Crazy Ray, got it. Yeah, we had proportion problems with the uh, buck. Um, we had to mm -hmm. constantly fix. Because he's so adjust. long in the torso. Yeah, he's so long right here in the torso. And, you know, he, he didn't want him to look too long or too tall, but he also wanted to have it look long enough so that he can do those weird movements. Because mm. he moves pretty much uh, as crazy as Crash and Eddie does. Mm. He ties himself into a knot, and uh, it's amazing. Okay. So here's the, <laughs> there was a lot of design iterations over this, this character. So initially they thought, you know, just smooth in the back of the head. Then they were trying to mull it. 
<laughs> um, here he is with a mullet. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the facial studies. 3D model and all the expressions. Well, not all of them, but several extreme expressions that he would have. And this was used by the uh, animators as reference mm -hmm. to make sure they hit facial targets. Here's some more expressions. Do they still do where they model each letter when they're saying A or B? Well, these are phonemes. Um, a, an alternate for A, like vowels F or PH. Here's the same shape for W and Q. Not really, it's more phoneme based. Um, okay. Not really for each character mm -hmm. or letter. So after all the character modelers are done, after all of the uh, material, well, the materials will still work while animation is working. Um, so in, in an animation pipeline, typically um, there's you know some bottlenecks. You have the character modeler needs to model stuff before the rigger can get to it. Um, so what they'll do is the modeling team will send a work in progress to rigging so that we can get started with some of their technologies to you know, rig up a character. And they'll keep on going back and forth, iterating back and forth until the rig is done. At that point, then the character is done. But uh, the, for the fur, they don't really need the rig. They just need the character from modeling. So modeling will give fur a, um, the fur department a, a, a work in progress as well as the rigging department. Rigging will also send uh, a work in progress down of a rigged character down to animation. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, fur department will attach the fur to that asset as it's checked in to the asset management system. Um, so when the animators pull the um, character, it's got a version of the rig and the fur rig onto it as well as materials. So they kind of work concurrently. Uh, the materials, fur, mm. and uh, yeah, materials and fur, and rigging. Yeah, that's the other one. They'll work somewhat concurrently. Once animation picks it up, well, and then they'll go to layout. Layout will lay out a bunch of scenes, and we'll get to the environments and layout in a moment here. Um, okay. I have a couple more questions in here. Okay. Um, so how long did it take to actually settle on Buck's character? Months. <laughs> it, it was one of the longer, it was one of the longer ones. Definitely. Mm. Probably a few months. I mean, the entire production process was about 18 months for Ice Age 3, mm -hmm. which is interesting because we moved in the middle of it from uh, North White Plains to uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. Wow. Yeah. And then there's a couple other questions. Um, I think Chelsea had one about beginning your journey in this medium, but let's get to, let's ask that at the end. Okay. Uh, and then, and project-based stuff. And then okay. there's something about blue sky content. So we'll, we'll, we'll ask that all later. Sounds good. So we talked about character vote well, So here's some of the poses and uh, so here, these, these, images came from the, the facial pose sheet. And these are the animator uh, poses that they did in 3D to try to match. And all this stuff is done to, and shown to the director to get buy off, to make sure that you're hitting the targets that the director wants. Mm -hmm. And some of these actually ended up better than the drawings. <laughs> <laughs> There I was. So let me actually pause this for a second. So um, once um, all of this work is done, the layout is done, animation gets it, and they put it an uh, animation test. Um, so this is just a face calibration test. Actually, you can see that by expression face cal right there in the lower left-hand corner. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. It's going to be synced to audio. There I was. My back against the wall. No way out. Staring into the heart of darkness.
<laughs> there I was. And this is a final Not final lit version of that. No way out. Staring into the heart of darkness. Okay, a <laughs> small sequence. So what I'm going to show is a sequence of shots um, in progression from uh, layout or from storyboard to layout, animation, lighting, and so on down the, through the entire pipeline. So this is the uh, bug sequence. Dude, so these are all awesome. masters or final. You're like the brother I never had. Me too. <laughs> Can we keep him? <laughs> Buck. What? The name's Buck. Short for Buckminster. Long for bar. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, if, if you've ever seen the movie, the Buck has tells a story, and there's there's a flashback sequence. That's what this will be. It starts with uh, storyboards. My back against the wall, no way out. Perched on the razor's edge of oblivion, staring into the heart. Of darkness. Then it goes into Darkness. animation blocking, rough animation, basically. I'm sorry, this is layout. So layout, we'll put this together to get the uh, the camera right. Make sure all the uh, environment elements are in the shot that are needed to tell the story. So you see this big cloud, that's just Geo, and it's basically a stand-in at this point until effects gets it uh, into the shot. <laughs> this is a different sequence, but this is the uh, animation, uh, the first animation oh, pass. Wow. On the razor's edge of oblivion, staring into the eye. Actually, we're going back the to the beginning of it. Looks like. Beast. And this where his mullet comes in, this flashback sequence. And here's lit final. Great white beast. Without a, without final effects, actually, this is lit and textured. Because some of those effects aren't right yet. Ooh. 
missing some stuff though. So there's the storm cloud. Should be the final. There I was. My back against the wall. So this has oh, final yeah. textures, lighting, First, final camera the moves, the all the effects. This is pretty much what was shot the in the uh, shown in the theaters. White beast. Okay, so um, these are um, some of the studies for the uh, Rudy, the albino uh, dragon. I'm going to try to go through this a little quick because I've got a, another section here to go through. We're only got 20 minutes left. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. These are all the extra characters that are in this, uh, the Lost World uh, or the, um, the Underworld uh, that uh, Sid finds with all the dinosaurs. Here's some color studies for those. There's flying dinosaurs, shielded dinosaurs. Wow. This is the first time that Manny realizes he's not the... Uh, the largest mammal in the world. <laughs> so um, for the environments um, or the sets, uh, there were some, you know, tasks to uh, try to uh, stay true to the Ice Age style, basically, for the even for the environments, uh, so that it looks like all the characters fit. So there was a lot of uh, studies done, some reference of underground caves and uh, underground um, water aquifers to see, you know, to try to come up with a style and a design that would work with for all the sequences that happen in the uh, in um, Rudy's world or Buck's world. So, yeah. Some of these paintings are really, really nice. So this is the entrance in, in, and the entrance into the dino world itself. Oops, sorry. Bear with me for a quick second. Is that gonna, there we go. Um, okay, here's some more. This is actually, once they get in, this is their first sight of the, uh, of the dino world. So for all of these environments, after all of these are sketched, approved, painted to get color approvals, um, the layouts are done so that uh, everything has is mapped out. Mm -hmm. um, then you got to model it all, <laughs> uh, or at least model the points to where that the camera is going to see. Um, so there's you know it's broken down into segments. 
so that they can all be put together as a, a cohesive, cohesive whole. Then you have to determine proportion of character to the uh, environment to make sure that uh, it fits. A lot of these, uh, this vegetation is designed to be bigger than the uh, characters from uh, the Ice Age world, mainly because they're supposed to be designed to be small and insignificant in this new world. So here's some scales. Uh, basically, Manny and Sid were used for the, uh, the, the scale charts, uh, Manny being the biggest and Sid being one of the smaller ones. But not as small as I don't I, I think Crash and Eddie are just about the same size, a little bit shorter, maybe. And then the size of the dinosaurs. Aww. So this is a color chart for the vegetation for the different areas of the lost world. Uh, so each one had a theme to change the emotion of the storytelling. You know, so during the climax, you get more into the red hot lava areas. Uh, at the beginning, it's more subdued and cooler uh, until they, you know, you have a climax and then uh, uh, act uh, three of the movie. And then you come down to the final part of act three where it just it's easy and everybody lives happily ever after. Some more uh, plant studies, tree studies, flower studies, trees, forests. And I have in here, yeah, there's a lot of environments here. This is an interesting sequence right here where uh, these uh, rocks started to crumble as her as Manny was starting to come across to get to uh, um, Ellie. How do you determine what trees you use? That's the art director. He, mm -hmm. He'll go through, the director and the art director will work together on that. Mm -hmm. they'll, it's their vision of uh, what trees to use. Now, one of the, oh, can I get back? Um, well, one of the things that they, I remember them saying is that they, they wanted to use more palm tropical style um, vegetation, but at a bigger scale in this, in this new world, because that, that was an artistic choice. Oh, it did go on cow. There's, um, there's a couple questions and I know we're getting close to time. So let me ask. Okay. Um, there's one from Alex. Do you happen to find yourself developing many in-house tools for rendering, et cetera. Yes, um, or even for animation. And it depends on the project I work, I've worked on. Some projects are, you know, you have to develop, develop and work with particles, custom particle systems because of the requirements for the production. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, uh, crowd systems to uh, let the, uh, the directors and the animators choreograph uh, dance routines and things like that. That happened a lot in Ice Age 3, where um, the mini sloths that were worshiping, um, uh, actually, uh, is that Ice Age 3? It may be Ice Age 2, uh, where the mini sloths were, were um, um, you know, praying to Sid or worshiping Sid, and they were dancing. So the um, animators wanted to choreograph that, and we built a uh, a, you know, small crowd system for them to do that. Mm. I have another question I skipped over earlier that okay. I'm going to um, read. Um, how did your journey, how did you begin your journey in this medium and what started your interest here? Um, do we want to answer that now? Because that's a pretty long story. Let's keep that for after I'm finished with the slideshow, okay? It's, I'm almost, I think I'm almost done with it. Okay, no problem. Okay. So these are time of day studies for the environments, basically, and what different colors and different lighting moods would do to it. And, and this informed the directors and the art directors uh, of you know, 
how they want the scenes lit to tell the story. Here's some more. So this bit right here is uh, what we call the jungle of misery. Here is the uh, color carnivorous. So they wanted to use a lot of these carnivorous plants, pitcher plants, Venus flytraps, uh, and so on. So uh, we do what the uh, art department does is what they do called color keys, and they'll draw and paint and you know a shot of a sequence so that it, this is the way it should look for the final render. Not exactly because it's obviously a, a, a painting, but um, this indicates where the light is and where the shadows are and the color saturation and the feel of the shot. So the, um, the lighters and the material department will use these as reference to, for the environments to make sure that they get what they want. Here's a down shot of uh, the um, Venus flytrap. Here are some more design shots of it. And the, uh, the scale. Mm. And we know what's going to happen. So here's some designs for the, the, uh, the other flowers or the other plants in the area, pitcher plants uh, and so on. There are different styles and, sky, and size scales or size scale studies. Here's all of, for the, the Jungle of Misery, these are all the color keys that the uh, art department wrote, drew up and, you know, to, for reference for the lighting and everything. And we're gonna go ahead and show it. This is storyboard. It'll go through the same progression we saw before. Sounds like a Jungle of Misery to me. Storyboard, um, and layout, animation, effects, and then final. Hold on. Why? What's wrong? Peaches? What? No, it's just, I got a funny feeling. You're hungry, low blood sugar. Would there's some fruit? No, Manny. I wouldn't do that if I were you. This isn't exactly your playground. <laughs> like, like I'm really gonna be afraid of a pretty flower. <laughs> Bet you didn't see that coming. Ah! Manny! For the record, I blame you for this. Stop eating our French plant! Ah! That's it! I'm tearing it up from the roots! Do that, and it will clamp shut forever! What?! All right, preggers, don't get your trunk in a knot. I'll have them out of there before they're digested. Digested?! Ah! There'll be nothing but bones in three minutes. Well, maybe five for the fat one. I'm not fat! I feel tingly. Don't say that when you're pressed up against me. Not that kind of tingly. I can feel it too. Help! Someone help us! Oh, hurry! It's time to get buck wild. <laughs> Who's fat now? <laughs> ah. Whoa! <sighs> Buy a plant. Awesome. <laughs> Say something. Uh, thanks for saving us. Buck, will you help us find the floppy green thing? That's not Whoa. necessary. Yes, it is. Hmm. All right, I'll help you. 
but I got rules. Rule number one, always listen to Buck. Rule number two, stay in the middle of the trail. Rule number three, Who has gas travels at the back of the pack. Oh. Come on then, chop chop. We should all have <laughs> our heads examined. That's rule number four. Now let's go find your friend. Oh my. That's amazing. <laughs> All right, so Jamie, we have two, one minute. So I think if you've got a second to show your crazy Ray. And yep, we... that's the end of that. Um... <laughs> and then I just want to say, um, Jamie's going to be answering questions also after this goes um, live on YouTube. So he will be able to see some of the questions and we will be able to show them later. Or... Okay, so it's the one of the questions was what's one of the favorite characters or, or things I had fun working on. This was one of them. And so let me do this full screen. Choo choo, choo choo. You hear that? Listen, listen. There you go. Awesome. Short piece. It was a concept for uh, the a feature we worked on at uh, Disney. Um, so there was another question. Uh, how what my, about my journey and how did I get to where I'm at? We're um, gonna have to do that at another one, Jamie. We're out. We're, oh, we're out now. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, let's just do another session another time and 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 have you back on thank you so much thank so, you it's been fun really, really informative thank you everyone <laughs>